your internal rock of ages internal rock of ages bright and morning star the lover of our soul the friend that still gets closer to us than a brother the God in whom we live and move and have our being we love you we thank you glorify yourself in our lives and let your name be glorified Take all our worship in Jesus' name. Amen. Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. Soko para bada badash. Judges chapter 6. Okay, we're going to read verse 3 to verse um, 6. And I'm going to tell you why I want us to read 3 to 6. It's going to, um, I'm going to explain some things to you there. Judges chapter 6 from verse 3. He says, so it was when Israel had sown, important, Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them and they encamped against and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come unto Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass. For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude. For both they and their camels were without number, and entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. I want to talk on destroying evil altars. Destroying evil altars. It's important that you please, I beg of you in the name of the Lord, listen to me because the Lord has a word for you. The place where we read is, is a scenario where Israel actually we know in the time of old they, they dealt on, 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 on agriculture, cattle, uh, famine, famine, water, and all of that. Israel, we are great farmers, but whenever they sowed, they planted in their land, when it's time for harvest, the Bible says that the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children from the east will come and plow the land. Everything that the Israelites were supposed to harvest will be taken from them. That speaks of the kind of life many of us experience, that we put so much effort into life and we see no corresponding result. With the kind of impact you have put into your life, you should not be where you are. This happened there. But that's not God's plan for us. That's not God's ultimate for us. In Isaiah chapter 65, if you read verse 21, the Bible says very profoundly, the Lord was speaking to us, saying, we will build houses and we will inhabit them. We will plant vineyards and we will eat the fruit of them. It's not God's plan and purpose, not God's predetermined counsel for you to labor and someone else rip. But when there are altars in the life of a believer, what's an altar? An altar is a meeting ground of spirits. An altar, if it's, if it's the divine altar, it becomes a meeting ground between God and man. If it's a satanic or an evil altar, it becomes a meeting ground between the devil and man. 
And many people are bound today because of altars. A young prophet came up. He had the call of God upon his life. And in 1 Kings chapter 13 from verse 1 and 2, the first thing that prophet did was to address the altar. Altar, O oh altar. In verse 2, he spoke against that altar. We discovered that the sin, why God was initially angry at Ahab in 1 Kings chapter 16 verse 32 was that Ahab raised an altar to Baal. That's why till date, heaven and Israel record Ahab as that prophet that angered God. Aside having a wife like Jezebel, he was the first who raised an altar to Baal. If you read 1 Kings 18, when you get to verse 26, one of the strengths of the 400 prophets on Mount Carmel was that they were leaping on the altar they have raised. The reason they were so confident and the felt Baal was going to answer them was because they had already established an altar. But Baal didn't show up because Elijah did something. In verse 30 of First Kings chapter 18, he repaired the altar of God that was broken down. Meaning the prophets of Baal could not trigger Baal without an altar. Elijah also could not trigger the move of God until he established an altar. So when there's an altar in the life of a believer, whenever you are trying, you discover something is wrong. You put in effort. It means there are altars that have been raised. Israel, the enemies penetrated them because there were altars that needed to be addressed. And if you study your Bible, clearly you discover there were several altars in that chapter. In chapter 1, the Bible says, in verse 1 of chapter 6 rather, the Bible says that children of Israel did evil in the sight of God. So if the enemy would not cut your joy short, Whenever you sin, something inside you dies. Sin postpones the day of greatness. Sin postpones a man's day of rising. Sin is a destroyer of destiny. God says, I'm of purer eyes than to build iniquity. The Bible says, and they did evil. Evil in the sight of God. Evil means wickedness in the sight of God. So many of us today are bound because of the altar of sin. One time God was talking to Israel in Hosea 7, I think verse 1. He said, I would have healed Israel, but iniquity was found in Ephraim. Meaning my hand was coming so much on Israel. When I saw Ephraim, I slowed down. When I saw Ephraim, I slowed down. Why? Because Ephraim had sinned against me. It's very important that when people sit down and they start binding the devil praying, you see, when people are quoting scriptures, they take a hold of the promise of God without fulfilling the conditions of that promise. Have you heard people quote the scripture, Job 22, 28? Thou shalt decree a thing, and it shall be established, and the light shall shine upon thy ways. Verse 29, when men are cast down, thou shalt say, there is a lifted... Now, hold on. Before 28 and 29, there was 23. Job 22, 23. He said, if thou return to the Almighty God, thou shalt be built up. Thou shalt put away iniquity from the tabernacles. Meaning, before you start decreeing a thing and it's been established, there must be the absence of iniquity from your tabernacles. We live in a generation now where iniquity has become so sweet. Sin has become so comfortable. People are no longer conscious of making heaven anymore. Listen, I, I mean, I said this sometime back. 
And I hear people say, and it's wrong. I hear people say, heaven is not heaven at last. It's not heaven at last. How can people say heaven at last? Brother, it is heaven at last. Don't let nobody teach you nothing. Don't let nobody tell you anything else. It is heaven. If heaven is not your goal as a Christian, then any other goal you have is transient, is ephemeral. They did evil in the sight of God. Don't let motivational speakers talk you out of the race. Making you feel that everything is about this world. Everything is about this world. Uh, 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 it's not just about heaven. It's about making it in this world. I have a message for you. I think Matthew 8, 36 or Mark 8, 36. What shall it profit a man? If he gain the whole world and lose his soul. Oh, you need to have investments. You need to have investments so that you know you can have something to depend on. You can have hope. I have a message for you. First Corinthians 15, 19. If only in this world we have hope, we are for men most miserable. What is that? When I love the SU Christianity. I love the old time gospel. I love the gospel that tells you that you should be holy. I love the gospel that tells you about righteousness. Not this message that's going on now which they call the grace message. It is not even the grace message. The problem with that message now is not the message. It's the preachers of the message. Don't let anybody fool you. True message of grace is passionate about purity. Titus chapter 2 verse 11. Titus chapter 2 verse 11. Titus 2 I think. Titus 2 11. The grace of God will bring it salvation as appeared to all men. Verse 12. Teaching us. See what grace should do. The grace message should do. Teaching us denying ungodliness and worldly loss. We should live soberly, righteously and godly in this present world. What is being preached today is not the grace message. It's the message of convenience. Christ has done everything. There's nothing for you to do. Just relax. Just enjoy it. I don't understand. If that's what the Bible tells us, what would the Bible tell us in Galatians chapter 5 verse 1? Galatians 5 verse 1. Stand fast in the liberty. Stand fast in the liberty. We are with Christ. has made you free. He has made you free. But please stand. Stand in it. There's a part to play. Give me the message translation of that scripture. Give me the message translation. Christ has set us to live a free life. So take your stand. Take your stand. Give me the uh, uh, good news or amplified. Freedom is what we have. Christ has set us free. He said, stand there as free people. Do not allow yourselves. Do not allow. Meaning you have a part to play. You have a part to play. Heaven must be your goal if you are a believer. Heaven must be your goal if you are a believer. If your heaven is not your goal, then no other goal is of importance or essence. I hear possible are not under the law. We are not under the law. We are not under the law. But I'm sorry to tell you and to bust your bubble that we are still under the law. Ah, what is this man talking about? Romans 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. There is therefore now no condemnation. Walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Verse 2. Bring up verse 2. He says, For the law of the spirit of life in Christ has made me free from the law of sin and death. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ. So when you move out of one law, you enter another law. I've left the law of sin. I have entered the law of the spirit. So don't let nobody oh go back shaka. When I see it, when I see people whose eyes are of the goal of heaven, if heaven is not your goal, then why are you saved? Everything in this world will fail. Everything in this world will fail. Heaven is your goal. First, now, how do you prove that heaven is your goal? First John 3:3. 3, 3. Whosoever has this hope in him purified himself, even as he is pure. The hope of the kingdom, the hope of making heaven is what helps you to continually purify yourself. How oh, sin is your greatest enemy. Five things to do if you must be free from the altar of sin. Number one, avoid the magnetic field of sin. You cannot be praying against sin and your best friends are sinners. 
You can't be trained against alcohol, smoking, immorality, and the friends you have on your phone, on your uh, uh, WhatsApp, on your social media are friends. That's all they talk about. That's all they post. Block them. Block them. This thing is not going to be automatic. You can't be praying against. You can't be praying against alcohol in a beer parlor. You can't be praying against alcohol in a bar. You sit down in a bar. And there's alcohol before you. I shall not drink. I shall not drink. I, and the bottle is there. I shall not drink. Lord, I shall not drink. I shall not drink. You look and you, look, you pick a glass, put it on the table. I will not use it. I will not use it. You push it closer to the bottle. I, you, are, you, are, you are making a fool of yourself. God told Adam, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You know what Adam did? He avoided the tree totally. Eve came and began to observe the tree. This tree looks fine. Why did God say, avoid the magnetic field of sin? Avoid the magnetic field. Anything that has to do with that, have any, but listen to me, all those messages you have that have been telling you that Christ has done everything, just enjoy your life, pack them, drop them somewhere. Begin to listen to messages that will tell you how to make heaven. When you have overcome your weakness, carry the grace message and listen to it. You don't need message that excites you. You need message that will tell you to make heaven. All those men that excite you, live your life, do what you want to do. You are free, enjoy, enjoy, and you are shouting, you are shouting, you are shouting. Messages that tell you, you don't need to wake up at night to pray. Those are end time. In Jude 1 verse 4, the Lord described them. The Lord described them. For certain men have crept in unawares. Which were before of old ordained to this, con to this condemnation. Ungodly men turning the grace of God, our God, into lasciviousness. Can I get the, the, the message translation? He said, what has happened is that some people have infiltrated our rank. Our scripture warned us this would happen. Who beneath their pious skin as shameless. Hey! He said, listen to this. He said, uh, shameless scoundrels, their design is to replace the shared grace of our God with shared license. License. Which means doing away with Christ Jesus, our one and only master. License to sin. Somebody heard me, heard me preaching. A young lady told me, she used to hear all of those kind of messages. It got to a point. Everything that made her fear God, they tore it down. Oh, you don't have to do this. Oh, alcohol is not really bad. This is not really bad. It got to a point. She stopped going to church. She stopped listening to ministers of God. She began to listen to worldly music. Because they made her appear that there's nothing really special about Christianity. What is tithe? What is offering? What is fasting? What? They tear down everything that makes all the landscapes set by our fathers. They tear them down. What is honoring men of God? Are they your God? What is that? Uh, but you can drink, but don't be drunk. Didn't Jesus throw water to wine? You did, you, all kinds of things to make to kill your fear for God. So she stopped until she stumbled into celebration TV. She said she started following us. She watched one, she watched two. She saw a balance. And her fear for God began to come back. Don't let people tell you heaven is real. Surround yourself, surround yourself. They did evil in the sight of God. The magnetic field of sin. Please. Number two. If you must run from sin. You need to be connected to materials that tell you about righteousness. Go for materials. Go for materials. Go for books. Go back to tapes like this. Watch them over and over again because this world is not our home. We are going to be living here someday. Just imagine if this pandemic that happened was rapture. Would you have made it? If this pandemic that happened, this lockdown that just came, pam, if that was the rapture, where would you be? What life have you lived enough that qualifies you for life after death? What life have you lived? You want to break from sin? Spiritual materials. Paul was speaking to Paul, to, to Timothy, I think. Second Timothy, I think, 4 verse 13. Paul was talking to Timothy. He was reminding him. He said, please, when you are coming, bring my books, especially my parchment. Bring my books. Give me the message translation of that. The message translation. Paul said, bring the winter coats. 
which I left in trust with Cyprus. Also the books and the parchment notebooks. There were things I wrote down. I need to build my spirit with them. Materials. Movies that tell you about the coming of Christ. Those are things you should watch. Not movies that tell you how Christianity is now so free. How you can live the life you want to live. No. Movies that increase your fear for God. Not fear for the world. Not movie that tells you uh, 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 one thing is going on. Somebody is doing vaccine. Another one is not doing vaccine. This is antichrist. Uh, those are nonsense. The word of God is what stands. If you come as an agent of the devil who will stand against you, you'll be roasted. We know what we stand for. So, attacking one man that the man is an antichrist, the man is not an antichrist, I don't need all that. The information I need is information from God's word. Not something that would be, there's a confusion even in the body of Christ. We are praying who we should not pray against. We are supporting who we should not support. You know, there's a scripture that says, whatsoever. That word whatsoever covers you. Whether you are part of the plan, you are involved, it covers you. So it's very important that you get materials. The things that build your faith. Something happened some time ago. Somebody got me so offended. So offended. So offended. I live in this town. And from here to Benin City, Edo State, Nigeria, is about an hour, 30 minutes. And I entered my vehicle to head down to Benin City to talk to him and his family. And I was so upset. And there was so much anger. I'm going to be transparent to you. Inside me. I said, when I get there, I'm going to talk to this young man. Now, my anger was for a just cause. That I would talk to this young man that if he makes any noise, he may be, he may be they will lie down and flog him. I was that angry. When I entered into my car, and I told the, the driver, move, as we are moving. <laughs> they put on a CD. The CD was talking about the second coming of Christ. Before 10 minutes, I turned back. When I saw the second coming of Christ, I saw th th what they were talking about. Christ is coming. This is this. I said, Kai, <laughs> on my way now, I'm going. Christ comes. I won't make heaven. Reverse. I just said, turn. They said, sir, we are not going again. And I looked at them. I felt like knocking their head. Go here. Go to hell and die. Turn the car. That material saved me that day. Can I shock you? Three days later, the wife of that young man called me on phone. That he has been seen. The husband ran fire. And I'm trying to pull him out. Ran fire. I'm trying to pull him out. I said, tell him to call me. And he called me in repentance. And the Lord told me. He said, what you would have done if you had gone there that day is to aggravate it. But I have handled it. Look at the way God handled it. It came back to bring peace. But what I'm saying is that that material saved me. All those movies you are watching that don't help your spiritual life to grow. That don't help you pack all of them, drop them, begin to look for materials, materials like this. This kind of message that tells you that you are going to close your eye one day and that's the end. That's the end. How do I stand against that sin? Number three, don't forget the first thing, avoid the magnetic field of sin. Number two, anointed materials. Number three, pray for help. Ask for help. Ask God for help. Lord, help me. You can overcome sin. The first time sin was mentioned in the Bible was in Genesis chapter 4. I think there's six, seven, seven or so, or 16. The Lord said to Cain, he said, sin lies at thy door. But you have mastered it. He said, sin lies at thy door. Unto this shall be his desire. He said, and thou shalt rule over him. Listen to this. God told Cain, sin lies at your door. You will overcome sin. But did he? No. He still killed his brother. Why? The plan of God is that for us we can master sin. But it's at the door. Don't open the door for it. Shut the door against it. Cry for help. What is your... I, I don't know how somebody... Your biggest challenge in life now is immorality. Is covetousness. Is lasciviousness. And you are praying for a life partner. Are you okay? Your prayer is not a life partner. If you're a liar... Your prayer is not a life partner because if we marry somebody and be a, a liar to the person. Now you are a single liar. You get married and become a matrimonial liar, which is more terrible. It's better to be a liar as a single person than to be married and you, you, you start irritating someone with your lying spirit. Don't be praying for your husband. When you are a lady, you know you have sexual weakness. You become an adulterer in your husband's house. 
Leave marriage alone. Begin to pray, Lord, these thoughts. How can you as a young lady, the reason you want to marry is because you need a man to help you control your sexual urge. You have, you have a problem. People get married so they can have a partner to fulfill destiny. A young man says he wants to marry. Why? Because he feels that he's so immoral. He masturbates. He watches pornographic film. So he feels the escape route is to get married. When you now get married with that spirit, you have only graduated. You have stopped being a fornicator and become an adulterer. That's what you have done. So the Christ to God, your weakness should be your prayer point. Kill in my life the altar of sin. Altar of sin. The stronghold where yes, Satan holds me. Kill in my life the altar of sin. You see, and they did evil in the sight of God. Listen to me. People pray. Oh Lord, deliver me. God will forgive me. In fact, when I sin, God, that's true. When you sin, God will forgive you. But God does not wipe away consequence. God does not forgive consequence. Hosea chapter 8 verse 7, I think. Hosea 8 verse 7. He said, they have sown the wind. They will reap the white wind. Galatians 6 7 said, be not deceived. Stop this gimmick. God is not mocked. You finish killing somebody, you come to the altar, you need that. Oh Lord, I'm sorry. God said, no problem. They will kill your brother too. Oh Lord, I'm sorry. God said, no problem. You go through the consequence. How do I know? Paul was a, 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 the leader of a terrorist gang. He will beat up pastors. He will beat up preachers. He will beat up believers. In fact, when he encountered God on his way to Damascus, was in Acts chapter 9, he was going to get license, legal backing. He wanted them to give him approval to deal with Christians. And God met him. Can I surprise you? Paul repented. Paul got changed. But see, Paul left this world. They were beating him. Any be a pointer to preach, they will beat him. One time they beat Paul and they dragged him out of the city. They almost left him dead. Uh, why? He beat up people. They should beat him too. And you ask a question, didn't God forgive him? God forgive his soul. God saved his soul. But the consequence of what his body has done, he had to face it. You stole someone's phone. And you say, Lord, you are sorry. You didn't return the phone. You sold it. You say, Lord, you are sorry. No problem. Destiny will wait for you till you can afford a very good phone. Somebody will steal it. It's consequent. God has forgiven you. You make heaven. You, your soul will make heaven, but your phone will not make it to your house. Your soul will make heaven, but your phone will go to someone's house. So if you now know the importance of consequence, there are things you will not do. You just avoid it. You avoid it. For your own good. Lord, help me. You know what Peter said when the Lord came and, and the Lord helped him? The Bible said God gave him a net-breaking miracle. He said, depart from me. I'm a sinner. Help me. Stop playing Superman. You need help. All this message of convenience. I, I was reading church history there. If you remember, there was a man, I'm trying to remember his name, who was preaching the message of convenience. This message of grace going all about now, this, that, now. This man was preaching the message of convenience. And actually, that period, if they were going from house to house, collecting money from people. Telling them that if you want to commit sin, you want to, and the sin you are going to sin for next week, pay for it. We have already talked to God for, for you. You want to do anything, you want to kill somebody, just drop some money. It's called a message of convenience. You don't need it. Heaven is real. Heaven is real. Hell is real. Anything that kills your passion for making heaven wants to ruin your life. Materials, magnetic feed, cry for help. And they did evil in the sight of God. The second thing, second altar, which I see here, is in Judges 3, verse 23. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee. Fear not, thou shalt not die. The second altar, he must address is the altar of fear. Don't forget the first evil altar that opened them up to the devil was the altar of sin. This is the altar of fear. Fear. He said, Don't be afraid, for you shall not surely die. Meaning, if you don't fear, you will not die. That also means if you fear, you die. What you fear, is what happens to you. In Job chapter 3 verse 25, 
Job said that thing I greatly fear has come upon me. Fear! Fear! You must undo the spirit of fear. Fear is so demonic that it takes three spirits, three virtues to confront only fear. 2 Timothy 1 verse 7, God has not given unto us the spirit of fear, but the spirit of power, love, sound mind. Meaning only power cannot handle fear. Only love cannot handle fear. Only sound mind cannot handle fear. Fear is so evil that these three forces need to come together to handle just fear. Fear is the opposite of faith. Fear, F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real. Satan trying to make you bother yourself. Let me say this to you, don't ever forget this. When you fear, you worry. Worry does not take away the trouble of tomorrow. It steals the peace of today. When you fear, you worry. And worry does not take away the troubles of tomorrow. It steals the peace peace of today fear they were afraid 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 God said to, 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 to him he said fear not your people are running don't forget the Bible said they conquered and Israel ran into holes your people are overpowered because they are afraid he said you don't fear don't fear don't fear is it first Peter 4 8 that fear has torment? There is a when, when you are living a life of fear, it begins to torment you. It comes with torment. First Peter 4, verse 8. I think so. It comes with torment. When you are when you are scared, it, fear can actually affect your hormones. It can give you mental, mental, you know, mental attacks when you are living a life of fear. How do I confront fear? Number one, this is important. Avoid fear motivators. All those short videos that they sent to you, how one woman was crossing on the road, one vehicle now came, now crushed the woman, a skull now broken, now well, got broken, they now put under what a wicked world. Now that video, now what did you learn from it? Somebody's skull was broken? What did you learn from that? Those things that trigger fear in your heart. You are watching a video, you are shouting, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. You can't see on your seat. What, what do you need that kind of hypertensive video for? All those materials, you don't need them. Anything that will increase fear, say, don't send me. I don't, I don't watch certain things. Everyone around me knows. You can get into serious trouble if you send me some materials. I don't want to watch them. Tell me what God has done. If you are going to send me a video, send me a video of somebody who was almost under an attack and the Lord rescued the person. I want to see things like that. I want to see things like that. Avoid fear motivators. Because before the devil strikes you, he will trigger something that will make you confess it. When you confess it, you open the door for an attack. Let me give you an instance. Somebody walks up to you and says, have you heard? Hmm. Coronavirus, oh, COVID-19. Hmm. Have you heard that person say, yes, that man, yes, that's a Christian. Ha, he has it, he has died. Have you heard that person say, yes, he has died. Have you heard that one say, yes, he has died. And the devil wants you to say, if that man that could pray has contacted it, who oh, am I? And when you say that, boom, carry 20 face masks, put on your nose, put on your head, put on your ear. When there's no face mask in your brain, no face mask in your spirit, carry face, carry face mask, put on your ear. They have all kinds now. They have some they sew with clothes. Now it's not like fashion. When you wear black, you wear black face mask. You wear, what kind of nonsense going on? Carry it, wear it on your head. Put it on. When he wants to come after you, he will come after you. He will come. Why? Because you have confessed it. You have confessed it. Those, why? There was a fear motivator planted around you. Avoid fear motivators. Anyone that always come to tell you about, tell you fear. I used to have a member in, in our church. I rebuked him one day. I rebuked him. Anytime he comes to me, he says, sir, I saw this church. I said, what? Oh, the building was standing on one leg. As he was standing on one leg, he was shaking. The building was shaking. The building, I said, man, God is going to help us. God will help us. He comes again, he says, sir, 
I came to church. So I see blood everywhere. I said, I, I cancel it. God will help us. It comes again. He said, Papa, the way I saw Mama in the dream, hmm. if you get home, pray for her. One day I turned to him. I said, I rebuke you. He said, hey, Amen. I said, No, not demon. You, you, you. I rebuke you. It's you I'm rebuking. I don't want to see you in my office again. Don't come here. Why would you tell me what God is doing? Fear, 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 fear. Fear. Somebody walks to you, say, This journey you are going. Mm, mm. You may not come back. Look at him. Mm, mm. I will come back. Leave my house. Avoid fear motivator. When they bring up fear instigators, reply them with faith. Fear prevails when faith is in travail. Fear motivators. Number two, how do I handle fear? Cast out the spirit. It's a spirit. We can see what he said. He has not given unto us the spirit of fear. So fear is a spirit. It's a spirit. He has not given unto us the spirit of fear. Don't ever fear. Whether it's a man, whether it's a spirit. In fact, in Luke chapter 12, if you read from verse 4, he said, don't fear he that can kill your body. And after that, I have nothing to do to you. Verse 5, I tell you. He said, I warn you who you will fear. Fear him that after he has killed your body, he has power to put your soul in hell. And not five sparrows so for two fattings. Yet not one of them is forgotten before God. And the seven will say, for the very hair of your hair and numbered. You have more value than many sparrows. Cast it out. Say, spirit of... Anytime the devil is bringing, you know, panic and all, say the spirit of your... Get out! Get out of my life. Kill fear. One time I lived in an apartment that had four flats. And, I mean... We had no generator. I just got married. Then there, I think there was no generator. There was no for gas in the generator. And I had to open the front door. So I, I prayed from 12 to about 3 to 4. I studied and I slept on the couch. My wife was in the room. I was in the living room. And robbers were robbing in the next flat. And they said, Oh, this apostle, we said, where does, he, where does he live? They said, he lives there, lives there. So somebody sneaked and came to me. Lock your door, lock your door. I said, what? He said, robbers are there. They are coming to your apartment. I said, really? Say, yeah. I said, okay. I said, you go, you go. I left the door because I needed fresh air. I, didn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't expecting robbers. It was fresh air I wanted. So I laid down as I was studying the Bible. I slept off. I forgot what I was told. When it was morning, they came. They said, they didn't come here. I said, I didn't see anybody. I slept off. But they were pretty. Not. Now, I asked myself later. I said, what is wrong with me? I was supposed to lock this door when I hear something like that. There was this boldness the Holy Ghost gave me. No, I, I just knew you cannot cross this door. When you start panicking, even if you close the door, they will break it. You start panicking. That's why you wondered why robbers came. You were shouting, Jesus, Jesus. You say in Jesus' name, the robber said, Amen. Open your door. You know why? You were shouting in fear. You were shouting in fear. Jesus, Jesus, oh Jesus, 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 oh Jesus. The robbers knew say this one. He doesn't know Jesus. If you know Jesus, you will not be shaking like this. Fear. When boldness comes on you, you talk with authority. Cast out the spirit. Number three, altar, which we must handle today. This one, I'm angry. This one. Hey, <laughs> Verse 25. And it came to pass. Hey, the same night the Lord said unto him take thy father's young bullock even the second bullock of seven years throw down the altar of bar which thy father had cut down and the grooves by it altar of family connection listen to me listen to me every one of us must listen to this check the pattern in your family I don't understand why people will tell us now. Yeah, even medical doctors understand the power of family connection. Well, now we become Christians. Why do you go to okay? Why do you go to the hospital if you are a Christian? Don't go now. Stay indoors. Because if you get to the hospital, the doctor will remind you what family connection is. You have asthma. You go to the hospital. The doctor will ask you who in your family has asthma. Why don't you tell the doctor that you are under grace? You have told doctor, doctor, don't ask me that I'm under grace. You will die of asthma if you are not careful. Doctor, we ask you, who in your family has had cancer before? What the doctor is saying, let us trace the history. 
how come when we now say that in church you say no i'm born again i'm redeemed i'm a child of god i'm free from it but you the same you you carry yourself to the hospital you are asked the same question and you say uh, my mother this is you under grace my mother my cousin you are sick if there is something running in your family line confront it before it destroys you look at a man as powerful as moses Moses was a powerful man. The Bible called Moses in the book of Numbers the meekest man on the face of the earth. Moses was so meek that when God was angry with Israel, Moses said, don't touch them, kill me. Kill me. He was so meek. When people tell you that Moses was a man, Moses had anger, he had a terrible temper. That's not true. You can't be the meekest man on the face of the earth and yet you have a temper. So what happened to Moses? I'll tell you. The name Moses is not an Israeli name. It's an Egyptian name. When his mother gave birth to him, the mother didn't name him. It was Pharaoh's daughter that named him, that called him Moses. Moses means I drew him from water. And don't forget, when Pharaoh's daughter went to that river, she wasn't going there to take a bath. She was going there for a ritual. If she wanted to take a bath, she would have taken a bath in the swimming pools in the palace. She was going there to cry to the god of the river to give her a child. So when Moses came, she felt it was the god of the river who has answered her prayer. And that is why he said, Moses, I drew him from water. Everything that happened to Moses was water manipulated. Check his life. Check his life. When he ran from there, he went by the, by the, by the well of water. That's when he saw his wife Zipporah. When he led the people, he came to a major confrontation in his life called the Red Sea. Water. God said to him, speak to the rock. He smote the rock. What came out? Water. What was manifesting his life? His name. And it was because he struck the rock, that is why God said you are not into the promised land. So foundation, if you are not careful, foundation can even make you miss heaven. Family connections. You are from a polygamous home. You better start praying. Or else you will see yourself one day walk out of your marriage over a flimsy excuse. When things happen in certain families, you see women crying, I trusted him. I trusted him. Your father left your mother. It's no matter of trust. This is foundation that pattern that is fighting you. This is family altar, family connection. Stop crying. Brace up yourself. One of my daughters in church came to me and said, Daddy, I'm done. I'm not going back to my husband's house. I allowed her to talk. She talked and talked and talked and talked and talked and talked and talked. I was looking at her. And that's one of the things about women. When they come for prayer, let them talk. Don't stop them. They will talk and talk and talk until they will talk the solution to their problem. So he let them talk. He talked, talked, talked. He said, I'm leaving. I'm, in fact, I'm leaving. But should I leave? I will confront it. I said, no, I can answer you. How many people are married in your family? Four of her sisters had left their husband. She was the last child. I said, you better go home. Or else it will continue in the life of your children. Go home. It is altars. Family connection. <laughs> There are people today who are all single mothers. All of them are single mothers. All of them in their family. They are single mothers. They are speaking in tongues in their, in their apartment. And their husband is somewhere else. It shall not happen to me. It shall not happen to me. The enemy has broken your home. Let's be real. This is the gospel that I preach. Reality. I studied Hebrew. I studied Greek. But have you noticed I hardly preach Greek and Hebrew? If you want me to do a deep study on Greek and Hebrew, you'll be blown away. But I discovered that Greek and Hebrew cannot save people. It only helps you in your understanding. So I don't come tell you Greek and Hebrew. I preach reality. Family connection is real. And that is why many of us have to pray. All of a sudden, something just triggered you and made you angry. You say, you are tired. Have you seen some men? Are you not surprised? Little thing, they just get angry. Check their brothers, check their sisters, check what, what runs in the family. Some family they get married first five years, no child. It's like a pattern. Let me shock you. In, in then Abraham saw Sarah. Abraham liked Sarah because Sarah in Genesis 12, verse 11, he said to Sarah, He said, You know, thou art fair. I don't want to say you are my wife. In verse 14, Sarah was described when she got to Egypt that she was a fair woman to look upon. When Abraham told his servant, he said, go and get a wife for my son, Isaac. 
in Genesis 24, I think verse 16, Rebecca was fair. There was something in their genealogy that attracted them to fair women. His pattern. Isaac was not there when the, when the father married Sarah. Fair to look upon. In chapter 26, verse 7, <laughs> we saw what happened. He said, you say, oh, this is my, this is my wife because she's fair to look upon. It, it went in the genealogy and landed in the life of David. David was a, a man who passed through the lineage of Abraham. That was his weakness. In fact, when David was sick one time, they knew that David did not need Panadol. He did not need Chloroquine. The Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 1, 3 to 4, they look around the city for a fair woman. That was David's vaccine. And they found Abishag. The damsel was very fair. David was sick. They didn't get him a doctor. They didn't get him a nurse. They looked around the city for a fair, very fair lady. And they brought Abishag. And the Bible said the king could do nothing. They said, Kai is sick. Now we agree that David is sick. What was in that DNA? Don't forget, it also entered David's son. In 2 Samuel 13 or so, verse 1, he loved his sister called Tamar. Why? She was fair to look upon. It came to pass, Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister called Tamar. And Amnon, David's son, loved her. What was attracting them to fair skin lady? Family connection. There are some people, it's alcohol. A young man met me and said, mentor me. I said, what, is, what, 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 what do you want to do for you? He said, be my father. And I said, okay. What's the name of your church? Don't forget, the father was a drunkard. The mother was a drunkard. He had brothers that were drinking. He was the only one that was battling with it. What's the name of your church? He said, Rivers of Life. I said, eh, 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 eh. He <laughs> changed it. Change that name. R Rivers of Living Water. Yeah. I said, change that name. Remove river. Remove water. How can alcohol run through your family and you name your church? I said, hey, hey, call it rock. Call it anything. Not this one. This is something that is pulling you <laughs> unconsciously. <laughs> pulling you unconsciously. You have, you have to be careful. Wine. You are calling, you are calling your church new wine. One day you see yourself come and say, today is wine service. Everybody come with alcohol. And you see it like an inspiration. Altars are fighting you. Altars are fighting you. A, a great person I know, great man of God, all of a sudden he started going into some things, into some things. Pray for this, pray for materials, pray for that. And I was looking at him. And I'm very careful because I don't know the Lord can lead anybody. People were condemned. I wasn't condemning. I began to ask questions about him. And I discovered when he was younger, he was a member of White Garment Church. 40 years later, the thing entered him. Even now, as a great person, he would say, bring this material. Bring that one. I started praying. I said, this one needs prayer. Oh. There's nothing you will say. Because when somebody's under manipulation, he only sees what is right in his eyes. You are wrong. He is right. When a man is under manipulation, he is right. Don't call family meetings for him. He is right. You are wrong. Because he is blinded. He starts behaving like a fool. Galatians 3 verse 1. Who have bewitched you, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Once somebody is bewitched, he or she starts behaving like a fool. I will be back in one minute to pray with you. I will lead you in prayers against those three others. And then I will take testimonies and I will pray for the sick. In the next one minute, don't go away. I will be right back.
Now, I'm going to lead you in prayers. And please, 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 I'm going to pray it one after the other. You say this after me. In the name of Jesus. Every altar of sin in my life, your power is broken. Your power is broken. Your power, go ahead and begin to tear it down. The altar of sin in your life, begin to tear it down. The strength of sin in your life. Every altar of sin, oh God, in my life, in my destiny, on my path to my greatness, on my path of dignity. Today, I neutralize your strength, I neutralize your passion, I neutralize your power, I neutralize your strength, I neutralize your passion. in Jesus name Amen Every altar of sin is broken from your life. Now I'm going to pray against altar of fear. Seed of fear. Agents of fear. Oh God. My father, my father. As I pray, the altar of fear in my life, the spirit of fear in my life, I terminate your assignment. I terminate your assignment. in Jesus name Amen. the altar of fear is broken I'm going to take this final one and please if you have a family member if your wife is with you you will hold her hand if your children are there you will hold them if your brother is there you will hold them if none of your family member is around as you are praying be calling their names your siblings we are going to attack for the next five seven minutes the altar of family connection say my father my father every demonic altar in my family line spirit of 
pattern l'esprit de la de la that contended my father qui résiste à ma famille maternel paternel by the blood of jesus le sang de jesus i disconnect myself from you bala na bala bala baya ka i disconnect my siblings i disconnect my wife i disconnect my children i terminate the assignment of hell what stopped my father what stopped my mother you can't stop me i break your hold i break your hold i break your power in my life in the life of my wife in the life of my children my spiritual physical biological children wherever they are around the world whether it is my biological children or my spiritual children every altar every family foundation every family connection in your life break 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 Matana, Matana, break, 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 in the life of my biological children, in the life of my spiritual children, every family connection, evil foundational altar, break, 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 I break your power. I break your force by the power of the Holy Ghost. 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 I decree it is destroyed by the blood of Jesus. I neutralize. I neutralize. I neutralize. In Jesus name. Father, everyone watching or hearing the sound of my voice from any nation wherever you hear the sound of my voice every altar of sin in your life altar of fear altar of family connection the powers that has had your brothers and sisters bound that frustrated your father or your mother Matana Patana I lift up the blood stained banner of Jesus the blood that speaketh better things than the blood of Abel I terminate that assignment every Matana connection every Matana connection by the blood of Jesus let that evil foundation your assignment is over I terminate your power I silence your maneuvering I decree freedom where your parents could not enter you will enter the record no one could break you will 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 break you
Kalakudasa by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says, Have you not heard? Have you not known that the everlasting God, the King of the earth, neither friend that my zeal worry? There's no such in those understanding. He give it part of the fence. The young man may fall, the youth may utterly fail, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. He said, The children have eaten sour grapes, and the fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children sit it are set on end. He said, it shall no more be said. Yeah, your father made mistake. You shall be the correction. Yeah, your mother made a mistake. You shall be the correction. Yeah, your siblings missed it. You will be the trailblazer. You will be the pace setter. The power of the devil is broken in your life. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Jesus. I decree Je declare, whoever is servicing that altar like the young man in the book of 1st Kings chapter 13 verse 2 I say altar altar hotel I speak against the strong man Je parle contre l'homme fort servicing the altar qui qui rentre qui donne le nourriture ça aux hôtels I speak against the strong man Je parle contre l'homme fort whatever services that altar qui nourrit les hôtels the power is broken. La puissance est brisée. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 31 verse 3 The Egyptians are men, they are not God They are flesh, they are not spirits When the Lord shall stretch out his hand He that is heaven, he that happens and he that is heaven Shall fall together I command them to fall 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 in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I decree that this season, cette saison, you begin to walk. Tu commences par marcher. He said to them in Deuteronomy. He said, The Lord shall be with you, and you shall be greater than your fathers. I decree the Lord shall be with you, shall be greater than your fathers. You will break record. You will set standards. And you will make heaven. You will make heaven. The Lord take distraction from you. The Lord take distraction. You will not be seen conscious, but you will be conscious not to sin. The Lord help you. In Jesus' name. Your time has come. Your time has come. Your time has come. Now, when you get back, when you are done tonight, I want to advise you, if you are watching me, when you are done right now, we're prayed and all of that, at nine tonight, you can hear this message again and pray with it. You can hear this message again and pray with it. Just keep watching. Keep watching. This is a kind of message you need to keep watching over and over. Once a day, twice a day. Continue.